Family Theater presents Jimmy Durante and Barry Sullivan. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater, presents The Cadreman, starring Barry Sullivan. And now, here's your host, Jimmy Durante. Thank you, Tony LaFrano. Family Theater's only purpose is to bring to everyone's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives if we are to win peace for ourselves, peace for our families, and peace for the world. Family Theater urges you to pray. Pray together as a family. And now to our transcribed drama, The Cadreman, starring Barry Sullivan as Bill. All right, you people. Give me your attention. I got something important to tell you, and I want you to hear it. I ain't up here for my health, you know. Now, first of all... Now, wait a minute, Bill, wait a minute. You're uh, not in front of the troops now. You've got to go about this thing differently. People don't like being told what to do. Yeah, but you know what I got to say is one of the most important things in the world. Yeah, but they don't have to listen. They can tune out. They can tune out? Now, these people don't know anything about you, Bill. You can't just start talking as if you were the president and expect them to believe everything you say. They've got to know you're qualified to advise them. Oh. I died for them. Don't that prove I know what I'm about? I'm afraid not, Bill. A lot of men died because they didn't know what they were about. All right, you tell them, then. You tell them I'm not up here for my health, that I'm up here for theirs. That I know what I'm talking about. All right, Bill. I'll bring in some people, and we'll give them the true picture. Then, after they know you, they can listen if they want. I've known Sergeant First Class Bill Palachek for a long time, and I've always liked him. But I'll vouch for him later. I'd rather you heard first from a man who was his enemy. I guess you could say I was his enemy. Of course, the sergeant's worst enemy was the enemy, but I guess I ran the communists a good close second for a long time. My name is Harold Dorr, and I was just starting my army basic training when I met Sergeant Polacek. He was the field first sergeant of my training company, and I hadn't known him for a day before I thought he was about the worst human being I'd ever met. It started on the morning of that first day, and it was a kind of an impersonal anger at first. Then it was his general attitude that made me mad. There were about 300 of us standing in that first formation in the company street. It was cold and it was dark. First our platoon sergeants called roll, and then Sergeant Polacek took his turn. My name is Sergeant First Class Polacek. In a little bit, I'm going to be falling you out so the company commander can talk to you. But right now, my turn. First of all, stay away from that orderly room. Those people in there are trying to line up your paperwork. If you want to see somebody in there, see me first. There's something else you people ought to know. As of right now, there ain't a one of you people worth the clothes you're standing in. You're not civilians anymore, but you ain't soldiers yet. All right, when I get through with you, you'll amount to something. The next 16 weeks are going to be your basic training. They're going to be rough. I know, because I'm going to see to it. At the end of 16 weeks, I'm going to be standing here looking at 300 men who've been tireder than they ever thought they could get. You're going to be going to classes until you're blue in the face, cleaning your rifle till they think it's part of your arm, and drilling till I've worn you down clear up to the neck. And you know why? Because the better soldier you are, the longer you stay alive. That's why I'm in business. I'm not up here for my health. I'm up here for yours. You're going to learn how to be good soldiers. And you're going to die of old age, every single one of you. If any man of you, after basic training, goes out and gets himself killed in a shooting war, that man is going to have to answer to me. 
It was later in the day when I put my dislike for the sergeant on a personal basis. The rest of my platoon was having a G.I. party, the process of scrubbing a barracks building inside and out till it's so clean you almost can't stand it. I'd gone up to the orderly room to see if I had any mail. On the way back, I ran into Sergeant Polachek. Hey, you. Uh, me? I'm talking to you, ain't I? Come here. Didn't I tell you to stay away from that orderly room? I had to see about my mail. You what? I had to see about my mail, sir. That's better, but it still ain't right. Those people in there, they got work to do. And another thing, why aren't you helping in your barracks? You letting somebody else do your work? I was only going to be gone for a minute. It ain't your minute. What's your name, Trooper? Dorr. Harold Dorr. What? Harold Dorr, sir. Can't see any reason for calling us sergeant. You got something to say? Say it out loud. I said I can't see any reason for calling a sergeant, sir. Sir. Oh, you can, huh? No. And that's because you're not half as bright as you think you are. You don't like the army, do you, Trooper? No. Well, you're in it. And what's more, you're on my list, Dorm. I guess your buddies have done enough of your work. We're going to talk about this some more, but right now, you get back to your barracks. Yes, sir. On the double. The sergeant caught me a couple of times after that. Like a lot of the others, I got caught with my hands in my pockets... Had to do some exercises, yes, push-ups in the company street. Once he got me for a couple of pockets being unbuttoned, he cut the buttons off with his penknife and let me spend the rest of the evening sewing them back on. And then came the time when I was standing in line for chow outside the mess hall. How do you do today, Dor? Oh, I qualify, but I don't think I fired expert. How'd you do? Oh, about the same. You know, when they put that target 300 yards away, it gets pretty hard to hit. Yeah. I'll check, hit it. The sergeant? Oh, yeah. But he already qualified once, didn't he? All the cadrymen have to re-qualify every so often. How'd he do? Him? Oh, oh. Expert rifleman. That's about all he's good for, firing a rifle. Oh, I think he's all right. Oh, he's a vulgarian, a big-mouthed ape with no education at all. He hasn't got enough sense to come in out of the rain. Big Sergeant Polachek fired expert. <laughs> so what? In every other way, he's a bum, a wasted effort. Couldn't even make a living in civilian life. Hello, Dor. What? Oh. Uh, didn't know I was around, did you, Dor? Well, speak up. No, sir, I didn't. You got anything more to say to these people? No. You sure? I'm sure. All right. Come on, Dor. You and me are going to the CO's office, have a little chat. The company clerk was the only one in the orderly room. The sergeant sent him out to lunch. Then we went into the company commander's office. He sat down behind the big desk, and he motioned me to a chair in front of him. Sit down, Dor. Uh, you still feel the same way about being in the army? Yes, sir. Ah, you can climb off your high horse. I'm going to eat you. Cigarette? Uh, no, thank you. No, there's something we got to get straight. First of all, if I had my way, there wouldn't be any armies in the world. But outside of this training company, I don't get my own way a whole lot. I spent my share of time in Korea, staring at the sun in the summer and rubbing snow on my face in the wintertime just to keep awake. There were times I would have taken two years K.P., just to come back to the States. I got no use for wars. The world didn't have them, there wouldn't be any armies. That'd be just the way I'd like it. But, and I want you to get this straight, Dor. As long as other countries have armies, this country better have one. And if we're gonna have an army then, Trooper, it's gonna be the best. Because the best one wins. And the best soldiers come back. That is... They usually come back. See what I mean? I think so, sir. I guess if I have to be in an army, this is the best one to be in. Eh, maybe you don't like being pushed around. Most people don't. And if you don't learn some discipline, instead of me pushing you around, it might be that the enemy would be pushing your folks around. 
All right, I gave you a hard time about running out on a G.I. party. Maybe you thought it was important, but it was. When a man's under orders, he does his own work every second. That's a habit. You get into it right here in basic training. You don't, it'll mean lives later. I, uh... <clears throat> I see what you mean. Maybe you won't ever see combat. I'm putting a B on God every chance I get to see that you won't. And maybe you're right. Maybe, maybe I am just a bum. What's that you call me? A wasted effort? <laughs> sure, darling. But there are some things I can teach you. And they're the things you'll have to know if you ever do see combat. And you're going to learn them whether you like it or not. Nobody. Nobody's going to turn the lights out on one of you boys as long as I can help it. He gave me a week's restriction to the company area. Oh, not for sounding off about him, but for getting caught at it. In his words, a trooper's got to know what's going on around him. Would I say he's qualified to talk to the public? You bet I would. Next to the enemy, I was his worst enemy. And he was the best friend I ever had. Sergeant First Class Polachek had a lot of friends he never knew he had. 300 from that particular training cycle. But he had friends he knew about, too. Some who knew him better than he knew himself. My name was Maura McCafferty when I first met Bill. We went through high school together, or through most of high school, anyway. Bill enlisted in the Army in his senior year, the year World War II broke out. We wrote a lot of letters, but I didn't see him again until he came back from overseas. Then we got married, and we spent his leave time on our honeymoon, and then set up housekeeping near the fort where Bill was stationed, until Korea. It wasn't easy getting used to Bill when he came back from there. Sometimes he'd grind his teeth and mutter in his sleep. And sometimes he couldn't sleep at all. Those nights I didn't sleep much either. It just didn't seem fair. Awake, Bill? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm awake, honey. Just listening to that big mouse clock of ours. Want me to put it in a drawer? No, no, no. Mine not here in the morning. It's not the clock, anyway. You're dreaming again. No, just lying here, trying to get my thoughts sorted out. So many things to think about, I can't even worry about the long-term things yet. Long-term things? Mm -hmm. What are we going to do when I get out, you know? How am I going to support you? <laughs> Can't think about those things much yet. You don't have to, Bill. We'll be all right. Yeah, sure we will. It's the company. You know, I, I can't stop thinking about the company. Not for a long time yet. Yeah. Honey, you go back to sleep. I will. In a little bit. Want to talk? Talk? That's about all I do is talk. I get tired of hearing the sound of my own voice. Ever have anything like that happen to you, honey? No. You, you hear this voice going on and on and on. Then you stop and wonder who's doing all the talking. And when you stop, think about it, the voice stops. <laughs> you find out it's you. And you wonder if there's ever anybody talking... But you, I get sick, sick of hearing myself. There's nothing I can do about it. Nose counts, makeup classes, calling cadence. What happened today, Bill? No, oh, a lot of things. But there's one thing I think about. There was a rifle inspection this afternoon. You know, most of them kids had their rifles shining like sunlight, except in one spot where it really counts. What spot is that? Rear sight, mostly. That little round peep sight you aim through. I had to tell, tell, almost every one of them, I had to tell him to take his rifle back, clean it over again. 
Once they said, soldier, this rifle's filthy. It only got mud on it, but I can see fresh tracks in the mud. Don't bring it back till it's clean. Oh, oh Bill. Aren't you being a little hard on them? Hard on them? Mora, honey. How are them kids going to stay alive in combat if they haven't even got sense to keep their sights clean? How are they going to do it? That's why you've got to keep talking, I guess, Bill. You've got to give them the sense. It's your job. Yeah. Yeah, it's my job. And if I don't do it right, somebody's going to turn the lights out on some of them boys. Sure as shoot, and if I don't do it right, somebody's going to turn the lights out on some of them. Bill was hard to get used to. But I think I knew my husband pretty well before he went back to Korea. Bill was sweet. And I know he'd never lie about anything important. I think he was qualified to talk to just about anybody. I'd listen to him if I were you. When men gather together to study soldiering, some learn by watching and listening. But there are always some who give a minimum of effort to study. Some who'd rather follow the ones who've already learned. Like me. Uh, my name's Wellstrom. Uh, there was a lot of basic training that was too much like school for me. <laughs> I never was any good at that kind of stuff. So I'd just watch the others, and if one of the other guys did a thing a certain way, then I'd do it just about the same way. I got by okay for a while. But, well, there's some things a man has just got to learn for himself. I learned that one day when the whole company was out in the field. We were in the mines and booby trap area and some of the instructors from division faculty had just finished giving us a lecture about landmines. Well, after the first hour, we got a 10 minute smoke break. We were all down at the bottom of a little hill. And I saw the sergeant cut out for the top. When he got there, he turned. Wellstrom. Me, sir? Your name Wellstrom? Oh, yes, sir. Hey, come up here. Hey, yes, sir. I didn't know it then, but the whole hillside had been rigged and triggered. Oh, not, not with real mines, but with firecrackers set on mine fuses. You looking where you're going, Wellstrom? Sir? I asked if you're looking where you're going. Why, well, I guess so, sir. Come ahead. What kind of a question is that? Am I looking for? Hey! <laughs> hey! The firecracker made a lot of smoke, but I could see down the hill. Most of the company was laughing, and I, <laughs> I guess I kind of laughed at myself. Then I uh, turned around and saw Sergeant Polachek. He wasn't laughing. What are you laughing at, Wilson? I, I guess myself, sir. If that had been a real mine, you'd be dead in a half. You'd be all over the landscape. You think that's funny? No, sir. Why'd you set it off? I, I. Uh... I guess my foot caught a tripwire, sir. No, Wellstrom, your foot didn't do it. You did it. You weren't thinking. Now, look, we brought you boys all the way out here in the Thule's to teach about mines and booby traps. Now, why would we bring you all the way out here to tell you something we could tell you back in the company area? I don't know, sir. You don't, huh? Well, I'll tell you. The Army spends a big part of your basic training teaching you how to stay alive. This whole area is full of this kind of stuff. Phony anti-personnel, anti-tank mines. I'm going to send a whole company out probing for him after the next lecture. But you, you already found one. Yes, sir. Well, sir, I called you up this hill because I've been watching you. Sometimes you let other people do your thinking for you. You just watch somebody you figure knows how. Well, when it comes to some things, like mines, you don't always have somebody to watch. You understand that? Yes, sir. Yeah. Report to me after chow tonight. I'm going to ask questions about what you learned today. And you'd better have some answers. He made me show him my notebook once a week after that, but I didn't mind much. He made a lot of other guys do the same thing. After basic training, I didn't see Sergeant Polachek anymore. Not until one night about ten months later in Korea. The fighting was still going on, and the communists were throwing everything at us except each other. But most of it was going right over the top. I was dug in near a little rise of ground near the front when I heard somebody crawling toward me. Who's that? Take it easy, trooper. Take it easy. I'm on your team. Uh, okay, come ahead. Oh, man. 
man, if they lower that stuff, there's gonna be some lights going out along this line. Hey. Uh. Hey, you're Sergeant Polache. Yeah. Don't you remember me? Huh? Uh, Wellstrom. You put me through my basic training. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, you're the Tanglefoot. You know, you don't look the same with a beard. I didn't know you could grow one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, neither did I. That's their big stuff going over. I understand we've been knocking the daylights out of them Easter here. Yeah, they're great, huh? Well, I better get on. Where are you going? Just checking the line. I'm going to be moving up in the morning. Moving up? Yeah, you'll be hearing more about it. Hey, uh, Sergeant. Yeah? <laughs> I've been carrying this letter around for a couple of days now. To your folks? Oh, it's to my... <laughs> Oh, it's, it, it's, it's just a letter. In any mailbox is where I'm going. Maybe in a couple of days, kid. Okay, I'll keep it then. Thanks anyway. Well, that stuff's getting too close. See you later. Somebody ought to get busy and tell the world there ain't no glory in a war. Yeah, but when you get pushed, you push back. How are you going to get away from it? When they figure that out, maybe I'll do the telling. Okay, keep your head down. Same to you. What a guy. Lord, that was too close. And the sergeant was... <laughs> Medic! Medic! Sergeant! Sergeant Polachek! Sir! Sir! Sergeant Polachek. Oh, Sergeant... That was when I first met Sergeant First Class Polachek. Oh, we'd really known each other for quite a number of years, and he'd spoken to me many times. But this time was different. Uh, what's going on here? They turned out the lights on you, Bill. Then I'm dead? You feel dead? Huh. Feel different. Well, didn't you expect that? Some really... I mean, they really turned the lights out on me, did they? They really did, Bill. <laughs> I gotta think this thing over. And what do you have to think over? I got people. They're gonna feel pretty bad with me. You're gone. What about my wife? Who's gonna look after her? Your people are in good hands. Yeah. And the boys I trained? They too are in good hands. But the war, the... there will be a truce in your war. You mean war be finished? Well, that depends on the people. They must decide that of their own free wills. On the people, huh? Look, if I'm where I think I am, I can have just about anything I want, can I? Or anything within reason. Fine, fine. Then if you don't mind, fall them all out. I want a great big company formation right here in front of me. Fall them all out? Everybody in the world. I'm going to talk to them. If this thing is up to the people, then I want to talk to them. Well, I, I said within reason, Bill. People must choose to do things. If that should cease, even for a moment, man would lose the reason for existence. Choice must come from man's free will. Yeah, sure, that's fine. I just want to help them make up their minds. And you said that I... I know, I know. But I said within reason. Perhaps you could talk to a few. Mm, Fifty million. But they must listen because they want to. All right, I'll be reasonable. Fifty million. And like you said, they can listen if they want. But they got to be from all over the world. All right, Bill. But it will take time to arrange. Time to arrange? Well, it can't be done your way. It will have to be handled through normal channels. I've waited a long time for this. Maybe that's a pretty good thing. It's given me time to think out what I want to say. First off, I want you to understand I'm talking to all of you, not, not just Americans. This program is heard in a lot of places, like Asia, Europe, South America, more than a dozen countries. But it makes no difference to me what country you're in, what you do for a living, who you are. I got an arrangement to talk to all of you people. And, well, what I got to say is this. Peace is up to you. Nobody else. You, personally. If you want peace, you got to go to God and ask for it. Ask him to help your country's leaders find a good and lasting peace for every nation on earth. 
Because unless God helps those leaders, unless he does, you people are going to be stumbling in and out of wars just the same way you have been for the last 40,000 years. Now, I never got my own way much outside of my unit in the army. I can't order you to pray for peace. No. All I can do is ask, ask you for all of us, for all the soldiers and civilians who ever died or got hurt in a war. Work on it, you people. Peace is up to you. This is Jimmy Durante again. As we all know, the purpose of family theater is to further the practice of prayer. Family prayer. Just before the show tonight, I was looking over a list of the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who have contributed their time and talent to appear on family theater and, in their way, to urge you and your family to pray together. It's quite a list. We entertainers feel a real friendship to family theater. We like to think of ourselves as members of this family, too. After all, Family Theater is striving to bring to their audience wholesale entertainment and sound guidance. Anyone who has been a steady listener to Family Theater can vouch for the high, wholesome quality of its entertainment. As for the guidance it gives, what could be of greater value to any American than the way of strengthening the unity of his country at its foundation, the family. The slogan of Family Theater points that way very simply. The family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood, Family Theater has brought you The Cadrimen, starring Barry Sullivan. Jimmy Durante was your host. Others in our cast were Virginia Gregg, John Stevenson, Whitfield Connor, and Tom Holland, with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman, and was directed and transcribed for Family Theater by John T. Kelly. This series of Family Theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who feel the need for this type of program, by the mutual network which has responded to this need, and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who give so unselfishly of their time and talent to appear on our Family Theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Tony Lofrano expressing the wish of Family Theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home and inviting you to be with us next week when Family Theater will present The Man Who Bought the Phone Company, starring Loretta Young. Join us, won't you? Family Theater is broadcast throughout the world and originates in the Hollywood studios of the world's largest network, This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.